Welcome to a very special, chilly episode of The Drew York Show. Uh, my special guest today, JMKM. <laughs> Please come sit down. What's up, Drew? Not much. Uh, what would you normally be doing if you weren't here <laughs> mm. on a Saturday morning? Well, I'd probably be at home, maybe listening to some music or some podcasts, hanging out with Aki, maybe doing laundry. You just like flew in here last night, right? Yeah, I just got back. I was uh, back in Calgary for a few days, which is where I'm from. So, Were you visiting family there when you were there? Yeah, I was. I went back. It's kind of funny because like, sometimes it's hard to go back depending on like what my schedule's like. So, you know, I just miss my family and I had like a few days off. So I was like, I'm just going to make a quick trip there. So I've been going back a lot this year, though. It's weird. When I first moved to Toronto, it was like, I didn't go back home that much. I went maybe like once a year, but now I feel like I've, I've been four times this year. So, oh, wow. I mean, that's a lot of flying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I fly a lot, so I feel like I've gotten, it's weird. I've gotten used to it now. Taking a, a four or five hour flight is like nothing. It's like taking a, a car ride. I'll usually just like buy Wi-Fi and like get a lot of work done on the plane. So yeah, I, I tr yeah, I really can't sleep on flights. So I like me neither end up having to do something like I, I envy those people that are like asleep before the plane even takes off yeah I can't I can't do that <laughs> I, I can rarely sleep on on flights maybe if they're longer than like 10 hours like flying to Asia I'll usually sleep on the plane but yeah, yeah. other than that I'm just usually like doing work or listening to podcasts I listen to the Boosty Fade podcast this time I actually really need to check that out I have still haven't checked it out yet yeah check it out big up, big up Jordan and James shout out Boosty Fade <laughs> Um, I wanted to actually ask you about your family because I know your sister is an artist. She is, And so yeah. I was wondering if that's like something that's been in your family like for a long time because obviously music must have been in your life for a while now. Yeah. You know what's funny? Like my family is not, they're not a musical family. They're not like an artistic family. It's like everyone just kind of like is their own person and does their own thing. Um, I think my parents probably, you know, could have been very like creative people had that been more encouraged back when they were growing up. My mom has like a million hidden talents. She was like very athletic growing up. She like competed at a high level in like all kinds of sports, um, but she also had kids like really young. So all that stuff kind of like took a back seat. But yeah, my siblings, I have, I'm one of five. So I have two brothers and two sisters. Um, my older brother is like also very artistic. I don't think he's really done anything with it for a long time, but he used to be super into like drawing, like kind of comic style. Um, and then my other brother, he, I wouldn't call him like an artsy person, but he's definitely like got mad hidden talents. Like he's an amazing singer. He can play the guitar. Um, yeah. And then I have two sisters. So the older one, she's kind of like, we call her like the kind of smart, like more conservative one. She's an, <laughs> she's an actuary. So I don't even know if I you don't know, know what that is. No, what's that? I didn't know what it is either. <laughs> she's like, uh, actuary is basically they do like risk assessment. Um, all I know is that it's a really difficult like, degree <laughs> to get. It's basically like a mixture of like math and statistics. So that's like her whole world. And she's the best. Um, and then my youngest sister is the artist, Kat. Did you meet her mm -hmm. when she was here? No. Okay. She was just here in the summertime, but yeah, she's um, in her like, what is it? Third year of art school now. And it's cool. Cause like she was always into like drawing, but it's cool seeing her kind of like explore all these like different like ways of expressing herself. And yeah, she's like pretty good painter and illustrator. I think she's going to um, focus on like the painting thing for her degree. So yeah, it's my family, but we're not like a creative family. I would say my sister and I are probably the most alike in that sense and that we're like, is that something you, you bond over? Um, yeah, I think her and I can relate in a lot of ways I think we're just like a lot more similar than maybe my other siblings like the way that we view the world and everything like that so um but I love all my siblings I'm like really close with all of them so and it's cool having like kind of like a weird mixture of personalities because you can kind of like learn something from all of them which is cool um I wanted to ask you about um I never heard how you ever got started DJing oh okay so I'm wondering if that was back in Calgary when you were already in Calgary or was that when you you moved to Toronto and then started? Yeah. So I, I started in Calgary. Um, how I got into it was actually, so my ex 
in Calgary. He was like a really well-known DJ. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was always like very exposed to that world. He was more in like the battle like world, like the Red Bull three style kind of turntablist mm -hmm. world. Um, and then when he got into doing more like club stuff, we would actually, you know, kind of throw parties together. And I was more learning about the promoting side of things. But I was obviously always really like into interested in DJing. But I don't know, it just never really crossed my mind to to try it because that was kind of like his thing. Right. And then when we split, actually it was before we split that I was kind of getting more into it. And I was like, you know, I've always been like around lots of DJs and I've been interested in it. I might as well like try it. So I would kind of play around at home, like with his gear. And that's kind of how I started learning. And then, yeah, when we split up is when I was really like, you know what, I like this and I don't have to feel like I'm like stepping on anyone's toes anymore. So I'm just going to like try do it. But at that time I didn't really think I would really be doing it like seriously as part of my career. I still thought it would just kind of be like a hobby. Yeah. Um, and I think all the way up until I moved to Toronto, I didn't really think that it was going to be part of my career. I thought I was going to come here and like work on my like career as a writer in like the, you were editor. writing back in Calgary as well. Already? Yeah. So I was writing back in Calgary, like freelance for a bunch of like publications. That's where I started writing for like hype beast and stuff like that. Um, so I thought I was going to come out here and like really grow that part of my career. But then the DJ thing just kind of like took on a life of its own and I started getting like more and more opportunities being in a bigger market. Obviously that would happen, but mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's sweet. And now I've been here for three and a half years and it's so crazy. Like I, I still can't believe it. I still can't believe that I'm a DJ. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> like it's actually wild. Like it's so I never would have expected. Do you remember that. what your first booked gig was? Yeah, I do. So my first booked gig was, uh, with, um, this thing called the Market Collective in Calgary. I think it still happens. Um, oh, I met somebody that was a help run that was an event in Calgary. Oh, sweet. Yeah, it's like um, basically like an arts and crafts kind of like market where mm -hmm. people who make stuff bring it and sell it. And so, yeah, they do some pretty cool like music kind of programming and they have bands come and play and stuff like while people are shopping. And yeah, that was the first time I ever got booked for anything and like got paid too I was like sweet <laughs> I wasn't expecting to get paid at all and then I did and I was like well this is awesome but I remember being like I was so nervous like at that point I was still definitely like kind of planning out like sets right because I was just like wasn't good at the like on the fly stuff yet but yeah it was awesome I remember like it went really well and like lots of people were like stoked on it so that was definitely a big confidence boost did you did the writing sort of you already have people out here that you knew through writing before you came out here and tried to make it as a DJ as well? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know a ton of people out here, but mm -hmm. I definitely knew some people. Um, I knew a lot of DJs like that I'd known um, through like my ex's involvement in that world. But again, they, they were more people from like the turntablist world. Right. So I've known like people like DJ Dopey for like. Mm -hmm. ever i think i've known him for like 10 years also like um pat drastic like tom rex headspin grand theft all those guys yeah they, i've known them forever um through him but yeah i didn't really know anyone who was like really heavily playing like out in like clubs or bars here the person who probably helped me the most when i first got here was mike rock i don't know if you know mike rock i've never met him but i like heard his name a lot yeah so he's someone who like we had mutual friends in vancouver and that's how him and i connected and then when I got here, he introduced me to Ollie at Cold Tea. He had me come play with him at a Cold Tea barbecue. That was like one of my first gigs I, I ever tea. played in Toronto. So that was crazy. And then, yeah, they just became like the fam. And that was a good jump off point because people saw me playing at that Cold Tea barbecue. And then they're like, hey, like my friend like owns a bar. You should like maybe come play there. And that's how I started playing at like, I don't know, Churchill and a bunch of other places like that. So what was your impression of cold tea when you first got there? Cause I know like, uh, <clears throat> like I came from Ottawa, obviously like my yeah. impression of someone like somewhere like that. And I brought people that aren't from Toronto to like cold tea. And I just, the having like a, an outdoor patio bar, like behind like a mark, like a little mall, like in Kensington market is just so foreign to so many people. So like, totally. I wonder what your impression was like of that. Yo, I was like, this shit is crazy. Like I'd never seen, <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. and I'm pretty like traveled, you know, it's not like I've never been out of Calgary before. I've been all over the world, but like, I was like, this is really like really fucking cool. I was like, this is definitely like a hidden gem. And yeah, I'd never really seen anything like that. Like a Sunday daytime party. That's like, 
And when you're on that patio, you're really just like in your own world. It creates this like you lose time. Out yeah, there. you like lose it, track of time. <laughs> you lose your morals. You lose all kinds. Of stuff. <laughs> but it's it's so much fun. And yeah, I think it's sweet. Um, there's a party in in L.A. I, I mean, they do it all over the place now, but it's called the do over. Have you ever heard of it? No. So that's like a Sunday day party. And um, I'd followed that for like years online and stuff and like listen to all the live recordings and that kind of culty Sundays kind of reminds me of like our like do over. Like it's just like an iconic now. I, I really do think it's like an iconic thing now. Um, I'm wondering when you first moved here and were first trying to get gigs out here, um, yeah. what was the biggest obstacle or the biggest challenge that you had that you kept facing that either you are glad to be not facing now or that you even maybe are still facing now or see other people facing now? Hmm. I think, you know, I've been... I was really lucky when I got here that I seemed to just like everything kind of seemed to just come together for me like really well. I don't know if that's like, I don't know why that is. Maybe I just got lucky or maybe people could tell that my intentions were always like pretty pure and good. So they were just like down to like do stuff with me. But I never seemed to have like a really hard time getting booked. But I do think the one thing that's a challenge for DJs in a city like Toronto that where it is like pretty saturated is um, just like staying like not relevant but like staying in it you know like you kind of feel like you have to like keep on doing it in order to do it if that makes sense i feel like we had that conversation recently even because you like took a trip recently and it's like you feel like that for a minute if you don't keep doing it that it's like it might be over and it's like you're at a point where some of your clients might not like totally ditch you if you leave for a little while but like i I can imagine if you're just starting out you like don't want to risk losing anybody yeah totally like you're just like oh my god if i'm if i don't dj for like two weeks does anyone still like remember me Mm -hmm. so i think that that's kind (laughs) of which seems insane right (laughs) (laughs) it's it's so crazy when you say it but it's definitely like a real thought and a real fear that i still have you know like i still look at myself as like a newbie in this and like still fighting as much as anyone else for to to get gigs and get booked so yeah when i went away i went away for four weeks and that was like you said we had that conversation it was a very real fear where i was like oh my god like what's gonna happen and i'm like lucky i have a few places that i play kind of like uh, semi-regularly so it's nice because I was like, well, if everyone's forgotten me, at least I can go back and like play at apartment 200 for my like, you know, my residency there or whatever. So, yeah, it's weird. I, I think that we need to get over that fear of always having to do everything. Yeah. Um, I wonder uh, how you met your boyfriend, Mike, because mm. Fri- Frieza Chin, he's yes. all because he's also a DJ. Frasia. And so I wonder how that started and then <clears throat> what that dynamic is like, because you're both you're not like necessarily like, I mean, I'm sure there must be like some competitiveness, but mm. it's not it can't be always because it would never last. if It was yeah. always competitive. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Like, I just like I if you would have told me I would date because I my ex was a DJ. Right. So I wasn't like opposed to dating DJs or something, but mm-hmm. I as soon as I started doing it, I was just like, "Whoa, there's no way I could ever date like another DJ." I always felt like there would be too much competition. Yeah. I was like I was convinced I was like I need to get like a a guy with like a regular job. <laughs> I was like I need to get like a finance district dude or something and I was like, "Oh my god." Um but yeah, we met through DJing. Um we got booked to to play a party together and actually we had like connected online a little bit before that cuz when I first got to the city, um you know, I obviously started following a lot of other like DJs and stuff just to like kind of learn what people were doing and what was going on it wasn't even doing it with the intention of like maybe these people can help me i was literally just like wanting to know what to other, learn yeah yeah as much as you can yeah so him and i connected like online a bit and then but we first met in real life when we showed up to like play this gig together and um yeah it was like a, a, a gr- supposed to be like a grime and dance hall party so random at the libertine and we didn't really interact that much that day obviously because we were like spinning right but um yeah, at the time I was doing like my radio show on TRP and I was like, yeah, you should come be like a guest on my show sometime. And so he did that. He was he was a guest on my show like a couple times. And then, yeah, we just like had a really like platonic chill friendship for like a long time. Um, I would see him like once in a while. I like went to a few of his sh- like gigs and then, yeah, I don't know what happened or how it like <laughs> it was really like just really naturally like evolved. Um, till we were more than friends so 
yeah but it's it's dope he's awesome i still like feel i feel like i'm like a bit giddy right now talking about him <laughs> but, um it's awesome there is definitely like it's like it's a some secret or something <laughs> <laughs> it was funny because like m- because when we first started dating everyone was talking about like how i was dating this guy named mike and everyone thought it was mike rock mm-hmm. there was like a big confusion that me and mike rock were dating <laughs> like, no we're not dating he's just like one of my best friends Um, And then there was also a lot of people who didn't know that Frieza and I were dating, but they knew who we were like separately. And then we would see them out and we would be like holding hands or something. And then there was this weird like moment where they were like, what the hell is going on here? But yeah, it was really funny. Um, I think it's honestly super dope and such a blessing to like have a partner who's in the same like field as you or can at least like understand kind of what you're going through. And yeah, it's dope. I think that what's cool with us is that we are very like competitive, like, but it's like healthy competition. Like we always like to push each other to like do better and be better and, and learn about different things that we wouldn't know. Um, and then we can also kind of like team up on a lot of things right. where, you know, he might have strengths in one thing and I might have strengths in another and then we can do that together. And that's like really rewarding as well. So, um, but yeah, Frieza is, is dope. Um, I know that I'm like not an easy person to like, be with per se i'm not like high maintenance or anything but i just i expect a lot of like the people who i'm close to and so he definitely like gets the job done he must you know he must have had an influence on like the music you're spending the music you're listening to right because like he's kind of done like in his own sort of like prolific way brought like a lot of um uk music over to yeah. toronto oh man and, like, like that, that 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 connection that people have talked about in the last like, you know four years or so yeah like he was trying to build that for time oh yeah and already building it you know for sure. That must he, have had a huge effect on your music that you're playing. And listening to. Yeah. I mean, I always kind of like, like that music, but he definitely has influenced me and like empowered me to like really play that music. I think that when I got here, I wasn't really sure how to like get into even playing that. I was like, okay, cool. I can play right. like hip hop and stuff at these bars, but like, how do I, how do I get into playing like at raves and stuff like that? And he's brought me into like so much stuff and, and really helped me in that way. But yeah, hundred percent. He's absolutely like, I'm going to just say it like, this is not even like bias, but he's one of the first people in Canada to like be pushing that sound and yeah. like him and him and people like Trey mission, like they were like plugging away at that for like years before anybody cared. And now like London's kind of trending and people are like, Oh, it's cool. Like grime music, but it's like, yo, you didn't actually care about that until like very recently yeah like people really don't know that trey mission really had like skepta and jme and like all these guys like on his project oh yeah like Like, before they were like before drake did or before whatever you know like yeah and people in england like really they fucking rock with trey as an artist and a producer like he gets a lot of love over there and like frieza too it was crazy we were at an event when we were just over there Mm -hmm. and uh some someone like in the like that we were just standing next to like recognized him and they're like oh are you are you Frieza Chin? And he's like yeah and the guy like recognized him from, like, <laughs> from stuff and I was like sick I was so proud I was like yes that's like, so sick yeah that's hilarious really dope, so. wow yeah. that's so cool yeah he's he's like a, a a wealth of knowledge about like all kinds of music though like he literally knows like everything about everything obviously all the UK stuff but he's like super well versed in like um reggae and dance hall as well so um yeah it's dope it's cool like learning about all that from him um i wanted to ask maybe like one piece of advice for a potential dj would be um i know you've been in the situation a bunch of times where you get booked to play something until two or three or four in the morning and Mm -hmm. it's like one type of energy and then you're playing maybe a store (laughs) at like 10 a.m yeah and there's a bunch of moms like shopping that just drop their kids off at school and it's like a totally other different type of energy yeah so how do you i mean a how do you manage i mean i don't maybe you don't sleep in that kind of situation but how do you manage kind of like scheduling in that situation and also like switching over because it's a totally different headspace you have to be in yeah it is it's really weird because i think that i've just gotten used to it now that sometimes i don't actually appreciate how like much like mental kind of like gymnastics that actually does take um i do sleep like uh, enough <laughs> I don't I wouldn't say that I sleep regularly sometimes like sometimes I am staying up really late and having to wake up early but I always try to like keep like a, a somewhat similar schedule and also catching up on sleep when you can is really important yeah like there's nights where I like I could go out you know on a weeknight but if I've been like working all weekend then I'll just like take that night to like rest 
Um, I think that's really important. But yeah, I think that it's weird. I, I play all different kinds of stuff. Like you said, like I'll do like retail gigs, like mall stuff, like weird things like that. And then playing in these like crazy parties. But at the end of the day, like all the music I play is music I like. Yeah. Like even when I'm playing at Nordstrom or Saks Fifth Avenue and I'm playing like more kind of like chill kind of like loungy vibes it's still all stuff that I really enjoy and so I kind of use that as like my time to like listen to and appreciate music as well especially Mm. in a mall it can be pretty like boring you really have to like (laughs) you know if there's not good people watching you really have to like figure out ways to like entertain yourself yeah and that's like really my time to like listen to music and like organize music as I go and stuff so yeah I don't know if that answered the question but uh, I'd like to know about um, your trip that you took to the UK recently with yeah. Frieza. And maybe, I know there's probably a lot to talk about, but maybe mm. just to contextualize, like maybe some things that stood out or things that you feel like you really learned or were able to take in when you were over there. Yeah, man, it was like such an inspiring trip. It really was. It's like, it's so crazy. Like England's a really special place to me, like personally, just because I was born there and my family lives there. Oh, I didn't know that. But yeah, I was born in Wolverhampton. Bop, bop, West Midlands. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, none of my family, I only have one cousin that lives in London. Um, and I haven't seen her in like 15 years. And so we stayed with her, which was also a crazy experience because like, I haven't seen her in so long. I was like, it's crazy that this woman is even like inviting us into her like home. Like this is wild, but we like got along so well, her and her like boyfriend are like so cool. And yeah, every time I go to London, because I don't have any real family there, um, I'm always like in and out like I go there for like you know four or five days and then I'm like out again staying with my family in other cities so that's why this time we're like yo let's go like let's go to England for like a good long stretch we'll have time to like visit the family but then we'll have time to like be in London and like chill and yeah it was super dope like we definitely did DJ stuff out there like we did a bunch of like radio we had like a few gigs but we also had time to just like really like check out like what was going on like just go to some events and like just like really take it all in like from like the dj and like music perspective and i think it's like it's easy to look at somewhere like london or any like bigger more established place and be like oh like fuck like i wish toronto like had this or like and kind of compare it but there's really no way you can compare a city that's like got way more people way more history Um, to somewhere like here I I still feel like although Toronto you know like it's it's not a new city but it's definitely still like baby in its infancy in a lot of ways like culturally and I don't think that's a bad thing I think that's actually really dope because we are we're in the time where we're all like shaping that to happen and um, yeah like I would say the one big takeaway from being out there is that like community driven grassroots movements whether it's like media platforms or events or whatever those things are really important yeah like even stuff like this the drew york show (laughs) this is like what i would consider like a community driven grassroots movement you know it's it's something that's like not uh driven by like any like financial gains at all it's just like yeah. doing it for the love of it and like stuff we're looking like for a sponsor <laughs> 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 but yeah it's so it's so important um yeah that's i mean we went to a few parties that are kind of doing that like one was that was really uh, memorable is this thing called keep hush and um it's basically like a boiler room like they live stream events online and um i believe it's like free to go to and like i'm like got a business mind so every time I like see something like that I'm always trying to put together like how is this working you know like if it's free to go to like how are these people making money right. to like pay the, the acts yeah, who are yeah. here and like eventually you're just like well either everyone's doing it for free or they're doing it for very little and that's how this is happening and they're doing it for like the love of it and yeah it was just super sick like the lineups that they put together are like absolutely insane we went to one um, you probably won't know any of these people but it was like just crazy like back-to-back sets all night with like really fucking big DJs like one was like Bok Bok back-to-back Marcus Nasty who are both like legends and then Murder He Wrote back-to-back Crazy Cousins Crazy Cousins is like the guy who did the original Do You Mind like the Drake one dance sample Mm -hmm. 
who is also like crazy legend and like this was just a free party <laughs> that you could go to and yeah so it was like seeing things like that and then also all, all the like radio um that we did out there was really cool too um people are just really putting in the work to like sort of build these things up so yeah yeah, that must be inspiring to you because obviously, like, you've, you've, I know you've had aspirations for radio and for or digital radio and independent radio and like these things for a long time. So yeah. I mean, it must be cool to watch something where people are really trying that. Yeah, for sure, and and you know, trying it and and building like really respectable, dope platforms out of like nothing. And we went to like a couple stations that you really see like how much you can do with very little. Um, one of them that was really dope is Pyro Radio. So our homie DJ Oblig had us on his show and, and you go and, and it's just this, a tiny, like I've watched like a bunch of their like videos and stuff before, but then you get there and you're like, whoa, it's like way smaller than it looks on camera. It's just like a small room. Yeah. Um, but you know, all the like DJs and hosts are doing like really fucking quality shows and they're all just like showing up, putting in work to sort of like build this community and, and it's all volunteer based. And wow. so, yeah, so that was really inspiring um, for me. But like I said, it just kind of reinforced uh, that that community driven like grassroots stuff um, that's centered around like giving artists a platform is super important. And I think that we need more of those. And and, and radio is my chosen like medium, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be radio. It could be something like this. It could be written platforms. Right. Like, you know, I've heard and this is like not. I want to say this is not like a, a subtweet to anybody in particular. <laughs> it's just like a collective sort of like constructive criticism. Like a lot of artists or, or creatives, like they'll often say like, oh yeah, I don't want to like do an interview with like that platform because it's like not big or doesn't have enough like reach or doesn't mm -hmm. have pop in social numbers. And I understand that perspective completely, but it's also like, you know, like it's also your part, like your part of like your duty or like as a, part of the community to sort of like contribute to those to building them up you know people can't just be always bringing you up yeah it's kind of like that like what's it the rising tide lifts all boats yes exactly <laughs> and so if if you're an artist like and you get approached by like a small publication who wants to do like a really dope story on you and maybe take some nice photos and like do a cool q a that really you can show your personality like just because they only have like 500 followers on twitter like it doesn't matter you should do it you know yeah no seriously so, yeah i'm gonna step off my soapbox now <laughs> <laughs> um before we close this off i want to ask you to um give me i because i know you're uh you have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to toronto food mm. and i'd like to know okay now we're gonna do an awkward cut because the battery just died <laughs> <laughs> but i want to ask you what are two spots in Toronto, mm. food spots, one well-known that you think people already know about, but you think deserves a little love, and then one that people definitely wouldn't know about, but you definitely deserves a lot of love? Okay. I think that one that people would definitely know about is um, Imanishi, Japanese spot on Dundas. Mm -hmm. We've been there together before. It's really, mm -hmm. really good. That's really good. Oh, actually, too, Bar Isabel is really good. Bar Isabel? Yeah. That one's on college. I think people would definitely know about that one, but it's super delicious. And then one that people wouldn't know about, um, I think oh it's- Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I really like um, this Chinese blog called House of Gourmet. It's like a Chinese cafe. I think it's kind of like a sleeper because a lot of people go to King's Noodle on Spadina, but House of Gourmet is the one. Cool, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Drew. I okay. love you. I'm a huge fan of you. And yeah, I'm Drew York Show. Okay. Thank you things. for watching the Drew York Show. <laughs> Until next time. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh my God. Um, yeah. <laughs>